Welcome. I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Comedian and sitcom star Jerry Seinfeld turns a popular bit from his stand-up act into his feature film directorial debut, Unfrosted. He explores a funny and fictional account of the invention of Pop-Tarts, the breakfast pastry Seinfeld grew up loving in 1960s Long Island, New York. Mo Rocca got a taste of the film before its release. The Post Cereal Company has reportedly invented a shelf-stable fruit pastry breakfast product. No. Yeah. His new film, Unfrosted, is a mostly made-up ode to the processed food favorite. The real story that we started with, and it's, I think it's the only real thing in the movie, is that Post came up with this idea, Kellogg's heard about it very late, and decided to try and catch up. Later in the show, Jerry Seinfeld looks back on enjoying Pop-Tarts as a kid. Policy? Well, I mean, because some parents did not allow them in the house. Where did you grow up? In Bethesda, Maryland, but we went... Well, see, we have, those were bright people there. Those were, that was a higher IQ in Bethesda, Maryland. I grew up in the South Shore of Long Island. And you, were you allowed to have them for breakfast? I mean, because, because for some people, they were seen as dessert. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> We ate absolutely anything at any time. I didn't have a salad till I was 40. That's not a joke. Then from American breakfast history to the rich past of fine Irish glassware, Connor Knighton visits the Waterford Crystal headquarters on the Emerald Isle to see what makes each piece so special. It's a painstaking process refined over centuries, which the company claims makes its crystal a cut above the rest there's even the slightest flaw in Waterford, it's smashed. We never do seconds, so there's no room for error in Waterford. We're luxury, so with luxury, expect the finest crystal in the world. If Paul Cody spots even the smallest flaw, he tosses the piece into the recycling bin so it could be melted down and reused. So there's an indentation right on the rail of it there. Oh gosh, that subtle? Yeah. Wow. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Jerry Seinfeld wrote, directed, and stars in Unfrosted, a story imagining the antics behind the invention of Pop-Tarts. The cast is full of his funny friends, including our contributor Jim Gaffigan, Melissa McCarthy, and Amy Schumer. Here's Mo Rocca. When I was a kid, it started with a stand-up bit. When they invented the Pop-Tart, the back of my head blew right off. <laughs> You can eat them on the run, eat them just for fun. And like any good comedy, it was based in truth. In 1964, when the Pop-Tart was introduced, 10-year-old Jerry Seinfeld fell hard. Did you have a favorite flavor right from the start? Brown sugar cinnamon, obviously. Yeah. I'm surprised that it took them that long to add frosting. It was two or three years. Why, you think that's obvious, frosting? Well, they look a little drab to me when they're not frosted. You're a tough audience. <laughs> I thought they were absolutely sensational instantly. But uh, I did not know, and my parents did not know, these things are not food. And they can't go stale, because they were never fresh. We are go for launch. T-minus three, two, one. It should come as little surprise that the man who headlined a sitcom about nothing. No soup for you. <laughs> has managed to build a whole movie out of that routine. In the early 1960s, the American morning was defined by milk and cereal. And the two undisputed giants of the cereal world were Kellogg's and Post. Major news from the breakfast world. The Post Cereal Company has reportedly invented a shelf-stable fruit pastry breakfast product. No. Yeah. His new film, Unfrosted, is a mostly made-up ode to the processed food favorite. The real story that we started with, and it's, I think it's the only real thing in the movie, is that Post came up with this idea, Kellogg's heard about it very late, and decided to try and catch up. They got a fruit-filled pastry, Dingus. Dingus? Who, who is a Dingus? Post, they did it. Our own Sunday morning contributor, Jim Gaffigan, plays Edsel Kellogg. When Seinfeld asked him to sign on, he was there. I would never bet against 
Jerry Seinfeld. You know, sometimes comedians can be funny for a decade or maybe a decade or two, but Jerry seems to have transcended, you know, four or five decades now. Ready and action. In addition to writing and acting, Seinfeld stepped behind the camera for the first time. Did you know you were going to direct it from the beginning? No, but I thought, what would be the least work? <laughs> the least work is for me to just tell the actor how to say it instead of me telling the director and then the director telling the actor. It must have been fun casting this. It was so much fun, and Hugh Grant was the guy who made the movie. Hello, everyone. Playing a certain oh. tiger. And look who's here. Good morning, Thurl. Is it good, Bob? Is it? Have you seen today's copy? Oh, we'll get it, Thurl. We've got the best serial writers in the business. We do indeed. We are so blessed. They're great. Just great. That's it. That's the line we've been looking for. Seinfeld called on a bunch of his comedian pals, from Amy Schumer and Melissa McCarthy. Stan, my friend, I believe we have split the atom of breakfast. To Sarah Cooper. Excuse me, Mr. Kellogg needs you. A meeting of the five serial families has been called. By who? What was he like as a director? What surprised you? He was very specific with what he wanted. There was a moment where Tom Lennon had to do this line where he had to do this, voila. And he did a take and then Jerry came over and adjusted his hands just slightly like this. And everybody's like, how's that making it better? Behold, life. But then he did it and it actually was better. I'm precise, but for my thing and what I do, I have to be that way. This is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Director Great. Jerry Seinfeld walked us through a Kellogg's-style funeral for a taste pilot who blew up during the creation of the Pop-Tart. And yes, that part is made up. You always want to be in very serious places in comedy because it makes it easier to be funny. Why do you think that is? The more you're supposed to act Right, when right. you act wrong, it's funny. When a man gives the last full serving suggestion of himself, only then is he truly deserving to be buried with full serial honors. This is where we lay in our premise. The premise is full serial honors. This is not something that you have heard of before. Right. So you have the characters repeat it three times. Full serial honors, Mrs. Schwinn. That's quite an honor. It's a great honor. What is happening? Snap! Crack out! Pop! If you look at my face there, this is what's hard about acting and directing at the same time. I'm directing here. Yeah. I'm just watching. Are they doing this right? I have completely dropped my character. Luckily, I don't take my work as an actor at all seriously. <laughs> but he did make sure the other actors felt taken care of. There was actually a moment on set that I think it was the only moment I saw somebody get a little bit tense. And Jerry was just like, guys, we're making a movie about a Pop-Tart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he put it all in perspective <laughs> so quickly. That's good, Kyle. <laughs> he would give a speech every now and then, and it would be pretty inspiring. What kind of things would he say? He would just say, like, I really appreciate you guys, your contribution, this is a really exciting thing for me. And he would speak from his heart. Jim Gaffigan and Sarah Cooper, when they were talking about you on the set, they described you as a real leader, that you'd give speeches and... Sure, you know, yeah. yeah. I'm a comedian, so I'm used to talking to people. Yeah. In an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what stand-up is. This is a very uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. We're expecting to laugh. You're expecting to be funny. That's not th that different from a movie set. It's, this is all awkward, and everyone's nervous. These things are the greatest two rectangles since the Ten Commandments. Yes, we had the toasted. So, okay. We had to ask whether Kellogg's was in on the action. Kellogg's did not have anything to do with this movie. Right. When you see the movie, you will understand no company would want a movie made about their product like this. Right, it it's becomes abundantly clear. Yes. <laughs>Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Mo Rocca's chat with Jerry Seinfeld, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. They take you to the same place, but in, from a completely different direction.
As promised, here's more from Mo Rocca's interview with Jerry Seinfeld. This started as a joke, as a bit, as a bit. Yes, it was a bit. I suddenly realized how much I loved them as a kid, and I think this really calls for a deep exploration. <laughs> And I, did, and I went out, uh, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and I said, I went to the supermarket, and I bought Pop-Tarts, and I brought them home, and I made them and started writing late at night. I realized I'm, I, it was just like a, you know, I was like a dog with a bone. I just, this is, this is my kind of thing. I, see, I thought you were kidding at first, so you... I'm always kidding. Okay, and then you pursue it, and then you get serious about it, and then you make it great. So, like, so, so, so you thought this would be a good bit, you went and you bought the Pop-Tarts, you brought them back. Yeah, I, do, I really wanted to explore the feelings that I had about it for myself. Because mm -hmm. I knew I can't be the only one that has these feelings about it. Because it was so unique. You know, there was cereal. Yeah. You know, cereal is... And pop, there's nothing, they have nothing to do with each other. They take you to the same place, right. but in, from a completely different direction. So that was what was exciting about the Pop-Tart. This rectangular was like this envelope. It was a rectangular, a thin rectangular item that you put in your toaster, which I had never used in my life, mm -hmm. the toaster. What would I go well, with the toaster? Right. So you remember those moments in your life. When the Pop-Tarts came on the scene, I mean, what do you think attracted you to them? I think, looking back on it, it was clear that a lot of thought went into this. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's two per pack, which is exactly what you need. The packs are individual, the different flavors. You know, there are certain things that go in your hand and do something to you. I've never uh, smoked cigarettes. I've always, since I was a little kid, I've always hated cigarettes. But a pack of cigarettes is a phenomenal thing to hold in your hand. It just feels good. It feels right, mm -hmm. the way it's made. And that Pop-Tart box, putting your hand on that in a supermarket, you're, you're, you're adrenaline, you're going, you're going, I don't know what this is, but I, I'm in on this. I want, I want to be part of this. And did your family have sort of a Pop-Tart policy? Were you Policy? Well, I mean, because some parents did not allow them in the house. Where did you grow up? In Bethesda, Maryland, but we would- Oh, so you had those from bright people there. Those were, that was a higher IQ in Bethesda, Maryland. It, I grew up in the South Shore of Long Island. And you, were you allowed to have them for breakfast? I mean, because, because for some people, they were seen as dessert. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> We ate absolutely anything at any time. I didn't have a salad till I was 40. <laughs> That's not a joke. How much of this do you think is about the name, though, the success of the Pop-Tart? Because it's a great name. 90%. Really? Maybe 95%. When you're a kid, you're, Country Square, Pop-Tart, it's right. over. And, and so just so people understand, Country Square was the name that... That Post came out with. Right. They, and they did arrive basically simultaneously to the shelves. Yeah. But the graphics on the Kellogg, Kellogg's, were, they were just better at it. They were just better at it. Yeah. Who would want to eat a country square? I mean, it's... Maybe they thought it was wholesome. Maybe Post was going for a wholesome angle. And I know you said it, that it's, it, for many kids, it's the first thing that you actually warm up. The Pop-Tart is. Yeah, and the yeah. cereal is the first thing that you assemble. Right. And eat on your own. I'm gonna get the milk, I'm gonna get the bowl from over there. I know where the spoons are. And you put that together. Otherwise, you just sit there and your mother puts food in front of you and you eat it. But here you have real agency. Exactly, agency. Yeah. And that and I often spoke of agency <laughs> uh, when, when were, I was 10. When you were 10, 11, yes, and 12. Yes, that was, it, it, I just thought, Mom, there's no agency <laughs> here. Will there be a sequel? I, 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 yeah. I never planned anything in my career. Yeah. This TV series was not my idea. The movie was not my idea. I just hang around, and if something happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I just like being a comedian. Up next, a cut above. Welcome back. Waterford Crystal is celebrated for its intricate, light-catching cuts that make it appear to sparkle. Our Connor Knighton saw firsthand how each piece is cut with care and precision. 
every glistening piece of Waterford crystal that ends up on a table begins in a fire. What starts as a molten mixture soon takes on any number of shapes, transformed into glasses and vases, buckets and bowls, one-of-a-kind sculptures and championship trophies. It's a painstaking process refined over centuries, which the company claims makes its crystal a cut above the rest. If there is even the slightest flaw in Waterford, it's smashed. We never do seconds, so there's no room for error in Waterford. We're luxury, so with luxury, expect the finest crystal in the world. Emily Brophy is the marketing manager for Waterford. Founded in 1783 in Waterford, Ireland, the country's oldest city. I think a lot of people know Waterford the name. I'm not sure if they realize it's a place. Absolutely, and it's really interesting. I had some uh, visitors here a couple of weeks ago and they said, wow, it's kind of cool that the city named itself after the crystal. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so we can't claim that because it dates back to 914 and our brand dates back to 1783. Many of Waterford's employees, like master glass blower Edgar Evans, have their own long histories with the company. My dad was here, I had four uncles here, two brothers. It's a family thing, really. It's also a royal family thing. Charles and Camilla toured the factory in 2022. The chandeliers hanging in Westminster Abbey are made of Waterford crystal. As is the ball that drops in Times Square. For the last 20 years, we've actually had the Times Square Ball in New York, so it's made up of many crystal panels, and each year those panels change to a new theme. So it's a very special moment for a very small harbour town like Waterford to be put on the map in such a way. Today, the bulk of Waterford's products are actually manufactured in Slovenia. In the mid-1800s, financial troubles shut down production altogether. The company actually closed. That was 1851. It wasn't until 1947 that we reopened. Closed for a century. Closed for almost a century. There's hope for everybody, right? <laughs> Waterford was resurrected after World War II. A new era of creativity led to a number of designs still in use today, including the best-selling Lismore pattern, inspired by the architecture of nearby Lismore Castle. Waterford found great success in selling its products to America. My dad used to work in the one side of the factory. I was working on the opposite side of the factory. But then they decided to put us over into America and do a father and son. So we used to go to most uh, department stores over there and independent stores, uh, signing the crystal. David Boyce is a master wedge cutter, a title that requires eight years of training to earn. He now teaches his craft to others, including yours truly. This is where it gets tricky now, Carl. This is where it gets. It's been yeah, tricky since we it. started. Let's just say I did not make the cut. Hey, not a bad, terrible, bad, oh, yeah. but I would not get hired with that. <laughs> no. <laughs> if Paul Cody spots even the smallest flaw, he tosses the piece into the recycling bin so it could be melted down and reused. See, there's an indentation right on the rim of it there. Oh, gosh, that subtle? Yeah. Wow. Historically, glass has been mixed with lead to create cuttable, eye-catching crystal with its signature look and sound. But times are changing. Waterford has started transitioning to a more sustainable lead substitute. Some cutting is now automated. The company's trying to attract a younger demographic, emphasizing that crystal can be an everyday indulgence, not just something that sits on your grandmother's shelves. There are certainly cheaper ways to get liquid to your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, why is someone buying Waterford? I think sometimes when you drink from Waterford, you sit up straighter. When you hold it, it's very tactile. It's about the sensorial indulgence of Waterford. So to your point, you could drink out of a $2 sippy cup, but actually it doesn't elevate the experience. It's about buying better, things that last. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.